people. God bless you guys. Bless you, bless you. Yes, please be seated. Okay, well, kids, don't go nowhere. We've got to stay for the announcement. Okay, and the announcement is not November 29th, 2015. My, 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 how fast the time flies by. Next, please. Okay, there you go. Hey, New Sanctuary Church in Tegu, Korea, this past week. Full report on that with when Tim comes up to share. Next, please. Ancestor Liberation Blessing is next Sunday, December 6th, and doors will open at 8.30 a.m. The Holy Blessing is 9.30 a.m., and the main ceremony will be at 11 a.m. Those are for people who have not returned to True Father's Authority. There will be a blessing that's available for you to come back to True Father's Authority before the ceremony. It's okay? And we'll have a little more on that as Mr. Greg Knoll comes up to talk to us. Next, please. Official Sanctuary Church 2016 calendar is coming. It will be available December 6th. Donation proceeds will benefit rebuilding of the worldwide ministries. So pick your calendar up for 2016. Next, please. 2,100 couples blessing in 2016. The date, February 13th, 2016. That's a Saturday, remember, because that's Father's birthday on that day. The time will be 10 a.m. at the main sanctuary. If you want more information, please talk to Mr. Greg Knoll or Tim Elder. Next, please. And there will be a matching workshop January 8th through 10th, 2016. Location to be determined. Participants are those who want to learn more about the matching process and their parents. Church members may come alone, alone or with an advocate who is helping you with the matching. Purpose to help unmarried matching candidates and their families prepare themselves in body and spirit to understand the matching and blessing in a principled way. To provide internal guidance to those already matched so they may receive the holy marriage blessing for returning to Father's authority in February or at a later holy marriage blessing. Please talk to those two gentle giants if you want more information on the matching workshop. Next, please. Check out our new website, sanctuary-pa.org. If you haven't checked it out already, we have new tags, new tabs, and new uh, information. All the latest news is right available on that website. It's updated on a uh, by daily, is it uh, every other day, right? Or, or every so often per week. <laughs> Constantly updated. So check it out, the new website, sanctuary-pa.org. Next, please. Pre-order your Constitution booklet. You can order your Constitution booklet today. It will contain the Constitution in three languages this is for pre-orders because right now we are still in the process of translating both uh, in Korean and Japan, Japanese. Uh, and the, the uh, translation process is, has already begun and we are going to be ready with it relatively soon. But you can pre-order it today. Next, please. Freedom Society meeting, discussion group led by Cook Jinim, will be head, held at 7 p.m. on Thursday, December 3rd at the Car Arms Factory. That's this Thursday. So if you want to learn more about freedom and responsibility, come and join us on that day. We go into very, very deep topics. So come and join us. It's a great time and very, very deep, deep, deep discussion and uh, uh, reflection. Next, please. And everyone is invited to lunch. We thank you all for the wonderful potlucks that are, that are being offered and brought in. And we thank all the kids who are respecting their adults at lunch on Sunday. And we've been asking the children to let the adults go first. And, of course, we want to give a big round of applause to the food ministry team who is watching us via television in the, in the kitchen. So thank you guys so much. We love you guys. Next, please. And attention, parents, we ask our youth to behave with freedom and responsibility. One of the responsibilities of our youth is to cleaning up after using uh, church facilities. Please remind your children to clean up after themselves. Next, please. Oh, that side. One side of the room is okay. Okay, so let's, well, hold on, hold on. Let's look at the next room. Oh, oh, Lord have mercy. All right, kids. One side was good, but look at that. Look at all that, right? So you have freedom, right? All you kids have freedom, and you have responsibility. 
right? So you are free moral agents, and it's very important to learn how to clean up yourself. So this is, is this your third, second warning or third warning? Second? Are you sure this? No, no, this is not second. We already got, they already got the second warning. It's a third warning, right? <laughs> nice try, kids. Nice try. Third warning. So what happens? So two weeks, that door is going to be closed. Hey, oh, you know, make sure when it's, open, when it's reopened, you clean it up, okay? You're free to play in there, have a great time. But freedom always comes with responsibility, and this is a great exercise for us to practice that, okay? So very good. So this, this uh, week will be closed, and next week will be closed. But after that, it's wide open again. And hopefully, you have a great time in there with freedom and responsibility. Amen. Okay, next please. Serving those who served our country, the time period here will be December 15th through 30th, 2015. The purpose is to serve our veterans during this Christmas season by adopting a family for Christmas. This is a real great program to give back to the people in this community uh, who have actually risked their lives to go on the front line to stand up for our freedoms. And the donations that are needed are Christmas dinners, toys for children, caring friend, a personal gift. Uh, please contact Lorda Schwartz and our Freedom Society team. Uh, you can email her or you can just talk to her. She's right there. Okay, so definitely try to adopt one of the veterans. I'm sure they will be so grateful uh, of, of the kind of love that is pouring out. Next, please. Christmas Sunday wor worship. The date will be December 20th, 2015. That is a Sunday. The location is Sanctuary Church Main Sanctuary. And a program, we will have a Sunday school choir. We'll have skits. We'll have folk dancing and more on Jesus's birthday. Of course, we know December 27th is not his birthday. We know that. We know. But we're, we're reminded of him and celebrating him. Amen? Next, please. Christmas party on Christmas Eve, December 24th. Eric and Luce Franco has opened their house to invite everybody to come. Let's give them a big round of applause, everybody. So you're all, we are all welcome to come. Just bring a gift under $10, and we're going to have some fun activities that we're going to do and fun little games that we're going to do uh, at, the, at their house. Okay, next, please. And a special thanks to Cook Janim's family for the wonderful Thanksgiving party and everyone who brought all the wonderful food. Let's give it up for everybody and the Moon family over there. Thank you guys so much. Wow, wasn't that amazing? Five turkeys. Boy, we ate through that so quick. They disappeared. Five turkeys, totally gone. Next, please. Keep connected. New connection cards can be found in your bulletin. Please take note of the new opportunities to become more involved with Sanctuary Church. We hope we want to connect with you and update you with many exciting events. So definitely check out your Keep Connected bulletin, your connection card. Next, please. And the Philippines national leader will be appointed today. So please remain seated for a few minutes at the end of the service. We have warriors that are standing up in faith in the Philippines. So definitely stay at the end of service. Let's congratulate them together uh, on, a, on a wonderful, wonderful and very courageous family that's standing up. Next, please. Okay, that is, I'm going to invite Tim, Mr. Tim Elder, where are you? World Missions Department. Let's give Tim a big round of applause. Come on. Thank you very much. That uh, uh, announcement on the Tegu Church was supposed to have a map of Korea in the lower right-hand corner, but somehow uh, it didn't show up on the slide. But... Um, uh, Tegu is in the southern part of Korea, in the south-eastern uh, part of Korea. Uh, and as you know, we recently announced also the creation of the Jinju Church. That was what, just a, a few weeks ago? And that's all along the southern coast. And of course, uh, previously this year, we, we announced the uh, opening of the Cheongju Church. That's right in the middle of the, of, of the peninsula in the mountains. And of course, the uh, Seoul Church was uh, uh, first opened in, in May. And then uh, in early November, they moved to a larger location. That's amazing, isn't it? In just over six months since uh, the opening of the Seoul Church. <laughs> now, Reverend Yi sang and uh, uh, Reverend Kim Yong-ha, uh, Reverend Kim Ga-byung, they're, they're pretty powerful people. 
But I don't think they're the ones that are fully responsible for this. Don't you think? How is that possible that so many churches could be opened uh, in the face of all this uh, opposition and persecution from the family, fed family Federation? Clearly, this is the spirit of our true father working in Korea because he loves Korea and he wants to bring as many people as possible back to his authority, even though Korea uh, as a whole has, has not received him. <clears throat> Now, the members of the Tegu Church, in uh, opening, as they were preparing to open their uh, new church, uh, released a, a statement. This was signed by uh, about uh, 30, 38 people, 30, uh, 30, 32 people, I guess, uh, in their names. And it's a long statement, but I don't want to read the whole thing, but I just want to uh, read just the, uh, the final part of it. And they say that the only person uh, who is uh, crying out with a voice of righteousness uh, in this age is... Um, uh, Moon Hyung Jin. He is uh, calling out uh, against the injustices being committed, committed against our true father. He is uh, speaking with true father's words. He is maintaining father's tradition. Uh, and he is uh, going with, together with a true father. And so uh, we have decided to uh, change our affiliation to the World Peace and Unification Sanctuary uh, because uh, that is where uh, we have uh, uh, Reverend Moon Hyung Jin, who is the representative and inheritor of our true father. He is the fruit of goodness, and he, is the, uh, he, he has the uh, pure lineage. And so, uh, so we are, are changing uh, the affiliation to the uh, Sanctuary Church. So that is uh, quite an amazing that uh, more than 30 people would sign uh, such a, a statement as they begin of their new church. And really the spirit of God is moving. <clears throat> so we have a, as we approach the um, ancestor liberation, many people around the world are really excited about this um, because as Greg will explain later, Ancestors uh, cannot be liberated uh, in uh, Chongqing anymore. Um, that uh, well, it is uh, through uh, Father's authority and through uh, uh, Father's lineage that is here in Sanctuary Church, centering here, that that they can be uh, liberated. One couple in Japan gave us a very um, uh, heartful testimony, where they had, as many couples, as many families in Japan have, they had offered everything. And they, were, they, they even uh, borrowed money with their credit cards and, uh, uh, and other assets that they had. They, they had offered everything in order to help Father uh, accomplish as much as he could uh, during uh, the time that he was on earth. And Father needed that while he was on earth. But you know what? Before Father left this earth, he told Kuk Jin Nim to say to the Japanese members that they were now liberated uh, from, that, from that indemnity, that they no longer needed to do that. And Kuk Chinim uh, conveyed that to the uh, Japanese members. I remember, I translated that. But this couple had offered everything, and they, had, but, and they wanted to liberate their ancestors, but they really had absolutely nothing to, to offer, to, through, through, to offer that to, through Chongpyong. For Japanese members, the first seven generations, Chongpyong requires $7,000 per line. Eight lines, that's $56,000 for the first generation. That's well over $100,000 for 210 generations. So they had lost hope in being able to liberate their ancestors. But when they heard that uh, uh, our king, uh, Hyung Jinim, is liberating ancestors for just a, a voluntary donation, or even if you can't make any donation, then none, none is necessary, they burst out in tears. At first they said they couldn't, even, they couldn't believe their ears that they were actually hearing this. You know, the Japanese church right now is uh, uh, pushing uh, every, all the uh, families uh, in their, that are still under their authority to donate more than $10,000 between, between now and the end of the year because they don't have enough money to, uh, to, for their uh, upkeep. Uh, they have a very large staff and a lot of assets that they need to, that they need to pay for. And I heard the, uh, recently that the Maryland Church in the United States has sent out a letter to its members saying that they have a monthly effort of $4,000 and asking for their members to, to contribute more. Now, early next year, we will be uh, uh, publishing our financial results for 2015. But uh, as, I, as I look at the results now, it looks like we will be reporting uh, total revenue 
uh, something on the order of uh, $800,000. Donations have exploded this year. Donations have really, really exploded this year. They're coming in from all around the world. They're coming in by check, they're coming in by PayPal. So you can really see where Heavenly Fortune is moving. The Japanese church, the Maryland church, all the churches, all the, all the family federation churches around the world need to stop their fundraising. Their ministers need to resign. They need to obey the instructions that the king gave earlier this year for all the public officials to resign. They need to let God's people go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. We'd like to invite Mr. Greg Knoll to come on up and give a brief report about the upcoming event. Let's give Greg a big round of applause. Thank you. So just want to give an update on Ancestor Liberation coming up. Father spoke in 1999. In the entering the new completed test age, you can complete the restoration of 160 families on earth as tribal messiahs only when you find and liberate your ancestors, starting with the first seven generations and then expanding to 120. And then later, Father went on to expand to 210 generations. And that will be, uh, that will be our responsibility as tribal messiahs to liberate these ancestors. So True Father uh, proclaimed that Young Janim's couple as the sole inheritor, inheritors, inherited the full authority of the true parents in the physical world. True Father performed this ceremony not once, not twice, but three times, and twice in Korea and once in America, so there wouldn't be any confusion on who his successor would be. This means that Young Janim, the second king of Chungil Guk, has full authority to liberate our ancestors. True Father, while he was alive, gave Young Janim full authority to liberate ancestors to those who died in the Korean War. The era of Chungpyeong is over. The king wants every blessed family to know that ancestors in the spirit world are very upset with the Han mother and her disobedience with true father. Ancestors need to know that God's lineage is firmly established through the three kingship providence. This is a very important aspect of, of the upcoming ancestor liberation. The king has stated that any sincere offering, great or small, will be accepted as a condition to liberate up to 210 generation. This is an amazing grace given to us by the king. The king is setting strong conditions for this grace to be made available to all blessed families. However, there is a prerequisite for blessed families to be able to participate in this unmeasurable grace of ancestor liberation and blessing. You must be re-blessed under true father's authority. If you participated in any blessing ceremony, after True Father's passing, your blessing was not sanctified by True Father, but rather by the Archangel. This is a very serious issue. This must be rectified, and blessed couples need to come back under True Father's authority. You can do this by receiving the blessing kit at our website and conducting the blessing, the blessing ceremony either in your own home or at a, or at a sanctuary lo location. If you register for the blessing online this week, you can still participate in next Sunday's liberation ceremony, even if you conduct the blessing ceremony after the fact. So this is something that was just announced by the king last week, that even if you are not currently blessed, and time is getting tight, we only have seven days left, that there'll be an extension, a special grace period, so that you can still order your blessing kit and receive the blessing kit, go through the blessing ceremony, and your ancestors will still be liberated on December 6th. So the key point is to go to the website, click on the blessing tab for all the details, register, and Sanctuary Pennsylvania will send you a blessing kit for a modest blessing donation. By doing so, you are pledging to receive True Father's blessing and can participate in the ancestor liberation ceremony on December 6th. Or another option that just became available on Friday is that you can come to Newfoundland Sanctuary on Sunday morning at 9.30 and receive the blessing ceremony right there at 9.30 before the liberation takes place at 11 p.m., 11 a.m. So doors will open at 8.30. Uh, 
for the overall ceremony. If you want to receive the blessing, please go to the website and register. Let us know that you're coming. And uh, that ceremony will begin at 9.30, so be here by 9 a.m. at the latest. And uh, so, you know, the idea is not to come at the last moment. Please arrive early. We're expecting large, a fairly large crowd. We're going to have it in the lobby. So uh, make sure you come early. Uh, we're expecting well over 200 people. And uh, there will be lunch being, will be served, but we're asking a $5 donation. It's going to be a box lunch. And the dress code is dark suits for men. And a red tie is preferred. And then uh, for women, uh, something light colored, beige, white color is best. And, uh, and also to help uh, the local members here, we're going to be passing out ancestor liberation forms after the anointing of the Philippine uh, le leaders. So if you want to stay in your seat, Lourdes will uh, pass out ancestor forms. You can fill it out right here. And then you get that taken care of, and hopefully you've been setting your own personal conditions up to this point. But even if you haven't, now is a good time to begin. We have seven days uh, to go before that ceremony. So thank you very much. Amen. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Greg. All righty. Let's now transfer this to HDMI. Okay, and let's talk, about to, let's talk about freedom and responsibility today. And let's go to Psalm 28 today, and let's read from verses 1 through 6. Let's read together. Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock. Be not silent to me, lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry unto thee, when I lift up my hands towards thy holy oracle. Draw me not away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity, which speak peace to their neighbors, but mischief is in their hearts. Give them according to their deeds and according to the wickedness of their endeavors. Give them after the work of their hands. Render to them their desert, because they regard not the works of the Lord, nor the operation of his hands. He shall destroy them, and not build them up. Blessed be the Lord, because he hath heard the voice of my supplications. Amen, amen. It is such an amazing time to be in as we now move towards answers of liberation uh, I know so many people uh, have been, who have been doing tribal messiahship, have been uh, working on the front lines, really have always had this in their heart, this, this, uh, this deep sense of, you know, uh, unfinished, you know, uh, uh, you know, incompletion. Especially to Father who said that you need the 210 ancestors and the angels to be around you. And so we're so happy that finally, the, especially in the Japanese church, the brothers and sisters in Japan can totally be free from the clutches of the archangel. And they can receive the freedom and liberty of all their ancestors being liberated. And no more are they slaves to totalitarians, people who want to exploit them. But they are recognized in heaven as the great heroes, the great sons and daughters of God who, who, with Father, stood with him every single day, in and day out, sacrificed everything. At this time, there are people who are standing all over the world who are, who are the, showing their true faith. Father said, he said when he was alive, two-thirds of the Unification Church are fake. They're not real. They don't believe in me. And you can see what's happening through this ordeal. You can see the fakes. You can see people who are fake, who are fake in faith, who don't believe in Father, who stood around for money or positions or things like that. You can clearly see it. Because when it's all on the line, that's when truth comes forward. And that's when people who truly believe 
when they're persecuted, when they're mocked, when they're scorned, that is when God's glory shines greatest. So we are living in such an incredible age, and I think it is such a, uh, (laughs) we're watching literally the book of Revelations and the whole scripture coming in before our eyes. But it's very interesting because when we see this scripture, it shows, it shows the cries of David, the king of Israel, to God, begging God of all these things, that God listens to him, that he stay faithful, that even though he's being mocked, he's, ch- he's being chased down, he's try- they're trying to kill him. And he's in the wilderness of Gad. And he's hiding. He has to hide amongst the caves. And he's crying out to his God. And only a handful of people that have been loyal. And he, he asked them. He asked God to hear his voice, to keep him faithful, to make him be loyal. And he also exposes the reality of those who speak peace, world peace. Oh, we want world peace, but mischief is in their hearts. They want world peace if they can extort money from good people is what they want. And it's been very clear to see how the totalitarians have behaved. We've seen the mother has fulfilled the role of the harlot of Babylon. She has totally worshipped herself, has left God, has left all of providence, and claimed herself to be God, put herself upon a throne, have become totally one with Satan, totally one has opened up the door of abomination. The Babylon is the door of the gods where everybody is now, you're all gods. Because once you get off of one god, you move to two gods, it's over. It's over. You're dead. You're going to be cursed. Once you move off of one god, it's over. There's no coming back. Because after that, you're not only going to have the empress God or the mother God, you will have all these true children themselves also claiming to be God. Grandchildren in the next generations, different peoples of different lineage who will say, ah, well, we're all supposed to be God. Woo in the crowds, bring them in by saying, you know what, you're all supposed to be gods and make you all sin against God. All sin. The worst sin, which is to believe that you're God or to want to be God. And we see the cup of abomination in her hand, totally prophesied in Revelation 17. The purple robes, the golden inlays, the jewels bedecked with jewels, scarlet crowns, to the letter is predicted. And it shows the great fall of Babylon, the great fall of the arrogant, arrogant city. And those who follow. We can see, of course, the total dethroning of true father, total dishonor in any type of, even if you're just a normal Asian person, this is the greatest dishonor you can do, especially if you are in a kingship. This is the worst thing you can do. This, is, this punt penalty is death, historically. So you can see the Spirit of God completely leaving. You can see the establishment of the fallen fourth position foundation in the family fraud church is teaching. The family frauderation is teaching the four position foundation of the fall. Family frauderation for world peace and unification. Let's all unite and have world peace. Just we want to be your rulers. And we want to have absolute control over you. The model has become the fallen model, Satan's model, the false god, Satan, making Eve the subject partner, Adam the object partner, and of course the fallen lineage. This has the four percent foundation has been reversed numerous, more than numerous times. Again and again and again and again and again, again, again and again and again in repeated literature and repeated propaganda to justify the betrayal and self worship and narcissism of evil. 
Here too, of course, as we see many times. Adam is the one who has fa had fallen with Satan in the Garden of Eden. Adam was the one. Oh, if Adam was just responsible. Oh, if Adam was just not playing around hunting or whatever he was doing. Oh, if he was just, if he would just, if he was always around, then Eve wouldn't have fallen. Actually, you know, Adam fell first. Adam fell first is what they have to teach. Satan tempted Adam, and since the nature of the fall was sexual, Adam and Satan had a homosexual relationship, which then led to illicit sex with Eve. She fell. She was the victim. Female responsibility avoidance syndrome again, again. And then the, the zaino kodomo, right? The children of sin spread out from the family to the world level. We can see Father removed, his crown is gone, hidden away. Father's name is removed from the blessing ring. Is removed. I mean, removed. Only Han Hak Ja is sitting there. There is no, nowhere. Father is nowhere. I mean, if you're so, so brain dead to not to see this, and not understand that this is total betrayal, I'm sorry. You have two brain cells. Either you have two brain cells or you're a total idiot. Right? Or you're a fake. You never really believed in Father. Doesn't bother you. The new FFWP, Trinity, where tr true Father and God are inside true Mother. They're totally subjugated. Right? Even God, the creator of the universe, is inside of her. In fact, she's God. And this is, of course, coming down the pipeline. Many of you three years ago who have known us for a couple years, we told you these things three years ago, and of course you're seeing them. Now, as she, the more she speaks, the more she reveals what she actually believes, and you will see more and more things coming down the pipeline. But on the H mother, Han Mother's leadership, we see the redaction of scriptures, total erasing of scripture, total desecration of scripture. We see the removal of the national anthem, which was written in torture in the prison camp, in the worst prison camp, Hungnam prison. Okay. All that suffering, all that pain. Oh, no, 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 no real suffering there. I suffered more than him. This is what I always heard. Always heard. I suffered more than father. I'm sorry. That's delusional. That is delusional. You say that to me once you're being beaten and ripped and kicked and water being poured down your face and you being electrical. You tell me that. Arrogance will destroy. Will destroy. Family pledge, blessing vows, Monotheism to diatheism, etc. All these things we've seen. Leaving her position as faithful, obedient object. Proclaiming herself as God, Messiah, only begotten daughter. Dethroning true father. Promoting the Han tribe lineage. We've seen it. See, no matter how many times they try to run away. They, you cannot run away. You, you, you family frauds. You cannot run away. I'm not talking to people here or our viewers who are awake or people who are, who are surrounded in a shroud of propaganda and political correctness. You don't hear the truth. Nobody speaks to you with truth. And you see it. You see it out of her own mouth. The only begotten daughter. All of Christian history was for the only begotten daughter right here. Again, all of Christian history. All of Christian history and the foundation of Christianity was for the only begotten daughter. Heaven's providence was all for the only begotten daughter. The big, the great Hanshi, Han uh, dynasty, 
the, the Chalanan Wanguk, the great kingdom of the Han Dynasty, and uh, that 그것이 한반도와 일본 번져 내려왔다. That expanded to Korea and Japan. So all you Koreans and Japanese, you're really Hans, <laughs> and you're a product of the Han Dynasty. <laughs> and of course, if you 그런 점에서 결론적으로 말하면 한반도는 제리메시아 독생녀 탄생시키는 나라이기 때문에 더, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if I conclude, Korea, the Prince of Korea, was for the returning Messiah, the only begotten daughter. <laughs> to total, 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 total. Re not only rejection, but 180%, opposite of what the principle says. And of course, don't mind the 2,000 years of Christian history waiting for the bridegroom. There's a little problem if the bridegroom is a girl. If the bridegroom is a girl, Girls, you have to marry a girl. <laughs> There's a little bit of a problem there then. <laughs> that may be trendy and cool nowadays, but that's breaking God's commandment. <laughs> and of course, putting these total, total fraudulent archangels. Oh, wow. Just smooth talking, <laughs> lathering her up, having dinners and fancy restaurants, lathering her up in worship. Why? Because they, they really respect her. They love her. <laughs> they want money. They want money. Money. They will be the first ones to throw her under the bus, which we told her three years ago. You trust wicked and evil thieves, you will get back stabbed. You have no discernment to discern between an honest person who has honor and who lives by an honor code, who has principles, and thieves, you're going to get robbed. You're going to get robbed. I'm sorry. You're going to get swindled. You're going to get robbed. And not only were you told, we told, we begged mother to see. Of course, Huma has split from her, as, you, as we told her three years ago. Of course, she said that Huma would never betray her, and she has total control over Huma. And what happened to father with the Kwakwe would never happen to her. Sorry, three years later. Very short, three years later, after the whole church is collapsing, she's now split, and she's now recruiting members in Japan. So why is it, why is it, see, we've been studying the last couple of weeks some very, I think, really revolutionary things. I mean, for the first time, there was a biological, epigenetic, and genetic explanation for why people, why people choose certain types of politics. In fact, ask some, talk to somebody and find out what their politics are, and you can figure out what kind of genes they have. <laughs> if you can identify their political positions, the majority of which can be divided into those two types of organisms, R organisms and K-type organisms. R meaning the rate of reproduction, the mathematical equation for, uh, constant for that, and K being the number of carrying capacity or number of resources in that habitat. So they refer to two different types of organisms which have two different types of reproductive strategies and survival strategies. And we have studied this in depth for the last three weeks. How many have enjoyed this for the last couple of weeks? I know a lot of our um, viewers overseas, maybe in the Western world, have 
enjoyed it. I hope in, the, in, in Asia, I think the younger people understand it. You know, if, if, if they're, I, uh, we found that, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's a great, there's a great um, sort of dis- rediscovery of the truths that Father identified as the central truths. For example, the nature of the fall, the nature of sexuality, sex, right? The nature of blood lineage, why that was the most important out of life, love, and lineage, why blood lineage was the most important, that was always a mystery. It's very hard to explain scientifically why that would be the case. But for the first time, through the biological lens, the epigenetic and genetic lens, we're able to see that it is the fundamental driving force. The genetics, the epigenetics, the chosen strategies, freedom and responsibility, all those are tied together. And they actually create gene sets over generations, which become solidified and concretized in stronger and stronger degrees. Harder to change. So we've seen a whole bunch of these last week. We went over all sorts of issues from debt, government to government, to gun control, to sort of, you all remember that, right? You haven't, I won't have to go on that today, but we're going to focus on one, and that is radical feminism. Why is it, why is it that you cannot create, criticize what is clearly wrong? Why? We're told about gender equality and it's time, and mother is bringing gender equality, rights for women, right? As if, if you say what she's doing is wrong, you are against women, or you hate women, or you are misogynist. This is a common feminist tactic, right? We've seen. For example, the original emancipation projects or the initial roots of trying to get women, for example, the vote. They start as organic movements. They start as real libertarian movements. They start as people freely associating, etc., and fighting for human rights. But then at some point, they start getting taken over by what? Centralized hierarchies or governments, bureaucracies. And as they do, they become propagandized. And as they become propagandized, those propagandists try to associate themselves with the original movements, which were organic, which were made based on free trade, which were based really to fight for equality, not for domination. Amen. Amen. But they take them, they associate themselves with being part of that, and so if you are against their current policy, you are against the original movement, you're against women, and you hate women, you're a misogynist, etc. It's very common in group behavior. So these social organizers understand group behavior, they understand herd mentality, they understand group psychology, and so they use it on you. They use it on the population. So radical feminism. We've seen how the R-type organisms comparative to the K-type organisms Like, for example, rabbits breed fast, they reach sexual maturity faster, they have more children, they're more promiscuous, they have more, they do not pair bond in lifelong pair bonding partners, etc. The goal of survival reproduction for that strat for that K R type organism, because they cannot fight predators, and predation is the limiting factor on that habitat. Remember all this? The type of survival strategy that is chosen is to quickly reproduce the gene set, quickly have babies, quickly have children, quickly, quickly, quickly reproduce. We can't fight off the predators. We can't stop the eagles from taking us, taking one of us. We can't stop the foxes or the wolves from eating us at time to time. So we have to hurry up and have babies, right? The faster you produce, the faster that gene set stays alive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We've covered this now for over a month. K-type organisms, on the other hand, they have delayed sexual maturity. They try to find quality pair bonding partners. They pair bond for longer periods of time. In the case of wolves, they pair bond for life. They have high investment in children. They raise their children with high investment because they have to train them in harder tasks. They are usually more intelligent. They have larger brains. They have to train their children in survival, hunting, things like that, which is much more difficult than eating a clover or a pink flower. So, 
those type of organisms, those two main types of strategies are biologically through the microevolutionary process. Like I said, if you have not heard my sermons on this, no, Christians and people who believe in creation have no trouble with microevolution. If you don't know the difference between micro and macroevolution, go study. I'm not going to repeat it here. Okay? So in those, in those strategies, we see human beings also have two subspecies. They have two different types of beings, which choose radically different types of political and social positions. They support certain things, but usually with the same crux. And the underlying purpose is, just like those animals, reproduction and survival. The replication of the gene set. Blood lineage. It's a war of blood lineage. Okay? So, let's zoom in here on one very, very important one. Because for the last 50 to 60 years, the Western world has had a great social experiment in radical feminism. Fighting against the patriarchy and fighting for women equality and gender rights. Right? If you're a young person today, these are all key words that you're pre-programmed with and you hear them and you have dopamine, re dopamine releases in your brain and you feel good. Oh, those are good things. You're programmed to do that. Right? So if you heard those words that I said, and you say, oh yeah, those are, yeah, those are great. You're getting dopamine highs because you've been trained to understand, you've been trained to accept this narrative. Number one, of course, the R-type organism pr promotes hostility towards men. And if you have not seen the whole sermon on the, all the different variations, go see it. You have to see it. There's a hostility against men because when men are not in the home, that is the most unstable biological environment for children. It is the most dangerous environment in terms of child abuse for children. It is the most dangerous environment for children when a father is not in the home. When a father is not in the home, that is the most dangerous sociological area for children to grow up in. So, radical feminism promotes hostility towards men, and of course, the R gene set has constant danger because there's no stability in the home. And so thus, there's a promotion of masculinity amongst women. Since fathers are bad, women can do it all. Women are supermen, superwomen, and they can do everything, and men are unneeded. And of course, because that's not true, they must promote the growth of government. Because government, in the end, what is it for? Radical feminism is for what? Resource transfers. That's what it's for. Guilting a population to give them resources. That's what it's for. Right? So you need a government, if you're going to get rid of all the deads, you need a government to help you. You've got to get the money somewhere. Right? So the promise is, if you divorce your husband, if you show divorce papers, then you get a welfare check. And of course, even though you have illicit relationships and you have sleep around like a slut, and you sleep around many, 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 many boys, boys, boys that have many, many babies, no problem. The government keeps giving you money or sex subsidies. That's what they are. So, you will see that our type of organisms promote government growth, promote government resource transfers, because they have to pretend that men are not needed and that men are not socially, sociological, the most important factor in childhood safety opposes, and of course our type of organism opposes slut shaming. You cannot say a lady who has, who has uh, slept around with all these men and have multiple babies, you cannot say she's a slut. You can't slut shame her. She's the same as you and me. She's the same as a person who kept herself for her marriage. That is an R type organism, right? Makes that argument. Right? So they have to relativize quality. In order to relativize quality, they have to break down those distinctions between quality and somebody of lesser quality. And they have to equal the playing field to keep the sexual access available to them and to reproduce their gene set, et cetera, and survival, et cetera. So of course they deny responsibility to women. There is the female responsibility avoidance syndrome, FRAS, that is commonly associated with this type of rhetoric and movement. And, of course, the promotion of institutional sexism. There's this grand patriarchy out there who is oppressing you all. 
You are all oppressed from the day you're born by this grand patriarchy that is above you, and you must break free of those chains, girls. You are helpless. You are blameless. You are all victims. Men harm you. They beat you, and they have domestic violence against you, etc. Right? This is a common rhetoric. Of course, we're going to see, and of course, K-type organisms say no. Women are moral agents. Women are also free peoples and individuals. They also have responsibility. If you're sleeping with five, six, eight different men, you kind of have a choice. Right? These men are not accidentally falling in. <laughs> right? You have a choice. You are a moral agent with responsibility as well. And you have to be accountable for your behaviors. Yes, people make mistakes, and yes, there's always roads to redemption, but you have to be responsible. You have to be accountable for your decisions. It is not victimization. It is not avoidance of responsibility. So let's look at some of the family structure. There's a great study on this um, by Free Domain Radio. Highly recommend it, recommend it, recommend it to, to see that. And uh, these slides are from that program, did excellent research. Look at some of the fam look at the real, see, this is the, look at, let's look at the real facts. We are told that there's institutional patriarchy, there's institutional hatred and misogyny of all women, and women are taught in the, in the colleges that every man is against you. Every man's a hidden predator. How many have heard that? Every man is a hidden predator. I had ladies literally say, oh, I realize, yeah, yeah, actually all men are predators. What do you think you are? <laughs> <laughs> rates of maltreatment by family structure. Look at the actual data. The actual data shows that married biological parents are absolutely the most safest, safest places for young children. With a serious child abuse or moderate child abuse, variation, let's go to moderate first. Married biological parents Number of children per 1,000, four per 1,000 are moderately abused by the married biological parents. You can see compared to single mom with boyfriend, eight times greater to be beaten, to be violently assaulted as a child, as a baby. Okay, let's go to serious child abuse. Serious child abuse, numbers per 1,000, 2.6 in married biological parents. By far the most safest place for children to grow up in. By far. It doesn't, doesn't mean your parents are perfect and your dad and mom never fight. No, it's the most safest environment for children to grow up in. Bar none. There's no comparison on the data. Zero. There's no way these are equal. 2.6 per 1,000 seriously abused in my biological parents. Compare that to a tenfold increase with single moms with a boyfriend. By far the most dangerous. The most dangerous. And look, look how it changes. Married biological parents to unmarried parents. People who are not married but living together. Look, there's a, there's a five-time difference. Just the fact that you're married makes a massive sociological difference. But of course, you're not told to look at this data. Don't be objective. Believe the propaganda. Don't look at real data. Right? You're supposed to believe the government narrative. You're supposed to believe it because then you can, they can transfer resources more effectively. You're supposed to believe them when the hierarchy says that. You're not supposed to look at real science and real sociological data. By far, having a married parents, biological parents are the safest place. I'm going to go through this very quickly. Life expectancy between male and females. 76.4 years for men, 81.2 years on average for women. Men pay the majority of social security taxes and are outlived by 4.8 years by women. But the government makes no fair adjustment to how those funds are distributed. This means an average woman can receive an additional 4.8 years of social security benefits. Okay. That's really not patriarchal. See, if it was patriarchal, it would be the opposite. 
If there was this grand conspiracy to oppress women and to keep them all down, well, you would have, and you would have the people, the men who are paying into this get the majority of the benefits. But of course, you don't have that. Social Security recipients, the difference in life expectancy at 65 years is for people who have made it to 65 years of age between males and females is 2.6 years. This means an additional 2.6 additional years of benefits for women among those to make it to 65 years of age. Social Security benefits broken down between retired workers, disabled workers, widowed or parents, and widowers and parents, and the fourth slot, spouses of retired or disabled workers. You can see spouses of retired or disabled workers. For women, 8% receive benefits, almost zero receive for men. Of all adults receiving monthly Social Security benefits, 45% were men, 55% were women, 80% of the men and 63% of the women receive retired worker benefits. 80% of the men, 14% of the women, percent of the women receive benefits as survivors, and 8% receive benefits as spouses of retired and disabled workers, compared to only 0.5% of men in both categories. Social Security contributions. Men contribute 59.3%. Women contribute 40.7% of contributions into Social Security. Benefits received are clearly not equivalent. You have literally almost a 20% more investment that men have to pay in to get the same amount, approximately, of receives benefits from the program. Hardly a patriarchy. You would imagine that if it was bigger, it would be the opposite. Men put in more, so of course they would get much more. Women would have to be begging, they would have been groveling. They would have to be groveling to get Social Security benefits, but the data shows very clearly the opposite. Medicare, comparing Medicare contributions, men were taxed an average of $1,479 each, compared to only $933 each for women. So the contributions into Medicare from men are 62.7%, and for women, 37.3%. Almost half. They contribute, almost, women are contributing almost half. And of course, are receiving more benefits. Oh, but I thought there was a patriarchy who was oppressing you. I thought, I thought everything is unequal. I thought everything is stacked against you, and it's misogyny that's holding you down. Maybe it's government victimization of your brain that's holding you down. A 58.5% difference in the amount of contributions that have to be made. Men have to contribute 58.5% more, and they get less benefits from Medicare. I thought it's all about gender equality. I thought it's all about fighting for rights and disadvantaged people. Well, then you should be fighting for men, feminists. You family fraud feminists. You should be fighting for men. Chronic homelessness. 75% of people who are chronically homeless in the United States are men, not women. If there was a massive patriarchy, you would, try, you would see that the patriarchy would try to take care of their own and take care of their men and be against women, be misogynist, so they really throw away men, use them, use them and throw them away. You know, they're not really useful anyways. Do you see that in reality? No. No. Homicides. 78% of homicides are by men. Are, are, who, people who die are men. 22% of homicides are women. American combat deaths. 97% of American combat deaths are men. Women make, women make up almost 15% of all active duty US military personnel, but are excluded by the Pentagon from frontline combat duty. Hey, what happened to equality there? What happened to equality? We love gender rights, right? Go on the front line and fight and die then. Right? Gender equality. 97% of men have to die. They burden the costs of war. They burden their lives. They risk their lives to die for useless wars that big banks create. And our sons have to die in these. And we are told that there's a patriarchy who is always misogynist and hates women. Well, if that was true, then we would be sending the women to the front line, right? 
the fog of propaganda surrounding people is unbelievable. It is a religion. It is ideology. This is not fact-based observation. This is religion when you talk about radical feminism. And unfortunately, unwitting young children who get sucked up in it. Don't look at this blasphemous data. Suicides, 79% of people who kill themselves are men. 21% women. Every 16 minutes and 36 seconds, a man commits suicide, but men are disposable. They have more sperm. They have billions of sperm. Women have those precious eggs. So biologically, scientists believe that men are more disposable. So culturally, we've developed those types of stereotypes about men. Okay, men are, you know, killing, men are killing themselves every 16, point, 16 minutes and 30 seconds. Not a big problem. Not a big problem. Imagine if that was turned around. Imagine if every 16 minutes and 36 seconds, a woman was committing suicide because of the stress load that she has to endure in the, in the Western world. Wouldn't they be outraged by that? You see the hypocrisy? The hypocrisy? It's okay if young boys die. It's okay if they go out to war and die, burden all the costs of war. Suck it up and be a man. No empathy for you. You're a man. You have a penis. You are disposable. This is a sociological tragedy that 16 minutes and 30 seconds, 6 seconds each, every, day, every, every 16 minutes, a man is killing himself because of the stress load. Criminal sentencing by months. Studies have found dramatic, unexplained gender gaps in federal criminal cases. Conditional unarrest, offense, criminal history, and other pre-charge ob observables. Men receive 63% longer sentences on average than women do on the same crime. With the same history of crime. Men are receiving 63% longer jail time. Where is the patriarchy? Where is it? I thought it was about equality, gender equality. Why aren't you fighting for men who are being incarcerated at 65% longer than women for the same crimes? Not really rational, is it? Women are also significantly likely to avoid charges and convictions and twice as likely to avoid incarceration if convicted. There are large unexplained gaps across the sentence distribution, etc. Death penalty. 97.1% of men, people who have been killed by the death penalty are men. Only 2.9% of women. Right? Do you really want to fight for gender equality on this issue? <laughs> College enrollments. 1970 through 2015. You can see 1970 here. The red line being females, males being the blue line. Significantly more males in college than after the invention of other types of instruments that made home life more easy, such as the washing machine, sewing machine, etc., those kind of things. You see an increase in the attendance and enrollment of college education for women. And really, in the 1970s and 80s, I don't think there were a lot of men who were protesting in front of the colleges saying, don't let these girls in. Don't let them in. No. If you want to go study, that's fine. That's great. That was usually the attitude in the West. Where is the patriarchy? In fact, now, you have 57% of females in college. 42.3% 42 are male. Why aren't you fighting for the rights of education for disadvantaged men and boys if you are a person who's fighting for gender equality? Hypocrite! You total hypocrite. You fraud is what you are. Total fraud. College enrollment, 2003. There were 1.35 females for every male who graduated from four-year college, 1.3 females from every male undergraduate. According to the U.S. Department of Education information, men make only 40% of college applications. Colleges can't accept students who don't apply, but why do fewer men even bother to apply, et cetera, et cetera. STEM field employment. STEM is science and technology, engineering, and mathematics. There was a recent study done by Dr. Williams, Wendy Williams, and Dr. Stephen Sisi, who examined these type of 
often repeated claims about male bias within the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The, and this is what they found in the paper. The underrepresentation of women in academic science is typically attributed both in scientific literature and in the media to sexist hiring because there's a patriarchy in power and if you're a woman, you are disadvantaged, you will, be, you will be discriminated against and there is sexist hiring practice so you will not be able to enter in. And so thus that would account for the pay gap, so to speak, right? That is what is commonly pushed in the media or in scientific literature. What do they find? Here we report five hiring experiments in which faculty eva evaluated hypothetical female and male applicants using systematically varied profiles disguising identical scholarship for assistant professorships in biology, engineering, economics, and psychology. Contrary to prevailing assumptions, right? What are the prevailing assumptions? That there are sexist hiring practices. Men and women faculty members from all four fields, all, all four fields, preferred female applicants. Two to one. You have a Two to one advantage over boys. Where's the pair? Where is the patriarchy? If you are applying to STEM field work, you have a two to one better chance than boys for at the even though you're comparable, even though your stats are the same. Just because you're a woman, because you have a vagina, that's why you get a two, po two to one over identical qualified males with matching lifestyles. And nobody even wants to look at the reality. You, you don't want to look at the massive sexism towards young boys. Why? Because feminism has become a government program. And like every government program, there has to always be the more radical, oh, it's, it's getting, even getting worse, 50 years of feminism, and now late, women are even more prejudiced. I mean, uh, more men, men are prejudiced against them even more. It's even worse now. Thus, we need more laws, and we need more funding, and we need more. It's, it's a government program. Comparing different lifestyles revealed that women prefer divorced mothers to married fathers. These are women who are faculty members who are choosing, and they preferred divorced mothers to married fathers and that men preferred mothers who took per per parental leaves to mothers who did not, etc. These are the statistics of that study. You have a, if you're a woman, you have a two to one better chance of getting a job, getting hired at high paying jobs. Not because you're better, not because you worked harder with equivalent males, people who are same statistics as you, you have a 200% better chance where is the patriarchy? Where is it? Domestic violence. Despite often repeated allegations, the vast majority of domestic violence cases are perpetrated by men against women. It's simply not true. Dr. Martin S. Feibert has compiled a collection of 286 scholarly investigations, 221 empirical studies, and 65 reviews and or analyses, which demonstrate that women are as physically aggressive or more aggressive than men in their relationships with their spouse or male partners. Even the bias, not just in name only, Office of Violence Against Women quotes sources which say 34% of domestic violence is against men. If you were wondering, there is no Office of Violence Against Men. See? <laughs> the studies, of course, show that out of domestic uh, uh, violence reported cases, 53.8% are by women. Not by men. I'm not saying men don't do domestic violence. Yes, they do. They obviously are comprised of the case. But it is not what the media and the government propaganda and the fog of propaganda bellows into you and beats into your brain that men are the worst ones. And they have pictures of the ladies with the black guy and, you know, fearful or being covered from behind their mouth, right? You've seen these propaganda pictures to assume that it's only women who suffer at the hands of men. Not men who can suffer physical violence, cut open eyes, hit by fry pans. Oh, just shut up and take it, right? That's assault. That is assault. You're a man, aren't you a man? Shut up and take it. Dr. Hines detailed her findings on what happens when abused men call domestic violence hotlines or shelters seeking help. I know many, I know many gentlemen men, many. I am one of them. I do not use force on my wife. 
You understand? I know many men who are, they, may, they don't have no, they have no martial arts training. They have, no, they, have, they have no interest in using physical force on people. Most of the times they're very into computers. Okay? And they don't like being beat up by their wife. They don't like being physically assaulted by their wife. And many times they'll just take it. Yet if the wife was being physically assaulted by the husband, of the abused men who called domestic violence hotlines, what happened? 64% were told that they only helped women. In 32% of the cases, the abused men were referred to batterers programs. Okay. So I've just been beaten by a woman with a fry pan and my bleeding over my eye. I don't want to hurt her back. Right? And I call this domestic violence hotline, and in 32% of the case, the people will say, oh, I will refer, refer you to a program that helps men stop beating their women. <laughs> you are being hit with a fry pan, you call for help, and you are told, we will refer you to a batterous program which will help you not beat your wife. Now, now think about this. If this was for any other category, let's say black and white. Let's say if this was reversed. And when a woman called in for help, 32% of the cases were referred to how to not beat your husband. When you're being beaten by your husband, right? See, you, the reality is that many, many good men have to suffer this iniquity at the hands of propaganda feminism, fake lust for power, clothed in gender equality, fake lust for power, and distribution of resources, clothed in sweet emotional propaganda. A little over a quarter of them were given a reference to a local program that helped. Overall, only 8% of the men who called hotlines classified themselves them as very helpful, whereas 69% found them to be not helpful at all. Look at, what, look, at, look at this in the Western world. This is Western Australia, right? You have the Department for Child Protection and Family Support. Women's Domestic Violence Helpline. The Women's Domestic Violence Helpline is a statewide 24-hour service. Great. This service provides support and counseling for women experiencing family and domestic violence. Great. Okay, this includes phone counseling, information advice, referral to local advocacy and support services, et cetera, liaison, liaison with police if necessary, and support in escaping situations of family and domestic violence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Men's domestic violence hotline. The men's domestic violence helpline is a statewide 24-hour service. Great. This service provides counseling for men who are concerned about becoming violent or abusive. Wait a minute, the Women's Domestic Violence Hotline says, this service provides support and counseling for women who are experiencing family and domestic violence, whereas if you're a man, the service provides counseling for men who are concerned about becoming violent or abusive. Ah, oh, that is a massive patriarchy, isn't it? What a terrible patriarchy. Wow, girls, you have to fight against that patriarchy. Look at that, they're oppressing you. If you get sucked up by fog or propaganda, you're the idiot. You're the idiot. Violence Against Women Act, V-A-W-A. As per the Violence Against Women Act, which is discriminatory within its title alone, states are encouraged to enact mandatory arrests, policies relating to domestic violence. This means that when someone calls the police alleging partner abuse, an arrest must be made, must be made, even if the allegation appears to be false. These policies completely ignore the constitutional protection of probable cause. So if somebody calls from the house, police have to come, they have to make an arrest, right? with no probable cause. Your constitutional rights go out the door. You have no constitutional rights because you're a man. They're out the door. You have no constitutional rights. You have no right for a jury. You have no right for it to stand and, and plead your case. You have no right. You're going to jail because somebody made a call. You have no right to defend yourself. You have no rights. Oh, but I thought we were for, so for the Bill of Rights. I thought the feminist movement is so against gender inequalities and they're fighting for gender rights and that noble cause. Except when it's with men. When men are suffering. Because they've been falsely accused and they're imprisoned. 
The predominant aggressor aspect of policies means that husbands who call the police on their violent wives are often arrested or threatened by the police with arrest. By the way, over half the women who do get arrested aren't prosecuted because their cases are dismissed by either prosecutors or the judge. According to a study from the United Kingdom, police threatened 47% of male victims of intimate partner violence with arrest. Police outright ignored 35% of male victims. And 21% were actually arrested instead of the female perpetrators. So this woman was beating him and 21% of men were just arrested. But I thought there's a massive patriarchy who is out to destroy you. Imagine if that was opposite. Imagine if 21% of women who called, I'm getting beat up by my husband, and 21% of you were actually arrested for beating your husband when he was the one beating you. Would that be fair to you? Would it be fair? Do you think that's fair? That is not fair. And you will buy this propaganda and you'll eat it because you don't want to look at the real facts. You'll buy the feminist propaganda because you don't want to look at the fact because men are disposable in your eye. And you don't think it's a tra travesty that every 16 minutes some guy is killing himself because he has lost hope for, all his, for any hope in his life. Oh, that's very compassionate. Violence Against Women's, Women's Act also provides women with the free legal counsel to pursue her allegations of, of abuse. But the men are on their own to find and pay for the lawyer. I guess that's pretty equal, right? That's pretty equal, right? So, so uh, if there's allegations of abuse, the women get legal counsel for free, and the men have to pay for legal counsel, even though they've been blamed. This is, is this, this is fair, right? In this whacked out world of propaganda and government programs, this is fair, right? Do you see what happens when you believe the archangel? You are living in delusion. Back upside down world, you believe politicians and you don't look at real reality and the suffering that's really around you. You believe your stupid lying politicians. Since women are rarely, if ever, prosecuted for making false statements of abuse, the VAWA inc incentivizes women to make false charges in the case of doors. Dr. Stephen Baskerville's book, book, Taken into Custody, The War Against Fatherhood, Marriage and the Family, describes how wives seeking child custody are instructed by attorneys to accuse the husband of abuse, which guarantees a rubber stamp restraining order. If you're going through divorce, just blame him. Just say he beat you. You're going to get the kids. You got to do it. In some states, if you're a lawyer who does not tell them to do that, you can be sued for malpractice. Oh, but there's a massive patriarchy, right? Massive patriarchy, right? Remember. Everything's stacked against you, ladies. You are the victims. You are blameless. You are helpless. You are not moral agents. You are totally frail and weak, and you are all dependent on men having to change. If they only change, your situa situation will get better. You are unempowered. You are weak and frail and useless. It's all men's fault, right? You see, that message, if you actually have a brain, that message is disempowering you. If you believe that men have to change for all women to be free, you believe in disempowerment of women. Yeah. You don't believe women are moral agents who can drive their destinies and change their lives. You fit the government program. One feminist blogger wrote, the government programs, the feminist government programs, put women in these inescapable boxes in which you can peer at them through a window. If, by ever, uh, a horrible chance, they would heal from the different traumas that they have incurred, well, there would be no more examples for funding, right? They need to be paraded around, charaded around. Look at these women who are destroyed permanently because of men. And that's why we need these bigger government programs. And we need to transfer more resources. Do you see what I mean? They're just showpieces. There's no interest in actual women, empowering women. You want to empower women? Teach them how to sh defend themselves and shoot a gun. That's you empower women. You want to do that? You want to really empower women? <laughs> I don't want my daughter to walk around in back, back alleys feeling threatened for her life. I want her to have be armed and locked and loaded, ready to go. And some fool tries to touch her, he's down. 
That's power. Not being put in a cage so people can veer peer at you and say how poor you are so then they can use you to get more government funding. That's not, that is not power. You are a showpiece. You are a moral agent. Women, women are moral agents. You have power, you have responsibility, you have freedom. You are moral agents. Men only do not have responsibility, so do you. Judges are required to consider allegations of domestic violence and awarding child custody, even though no evidence of abuse is required. Wow. Any allegations virtually ensure that the woman will receive child custody and the monetary support that goes along with it. Divorce, 66% of women file for divorce. 66%. Why do so many women file for divorce? Haven't we been talking about an archangel that's kind of saying, marry me, baby. Get rid of that fool. Marry me, girl. I'm going to take care of you. You do what you want. I, get, I take care of you. Remember that? 66%. Get rid of your husband. Get rid of the most stable, stable place for young children to grow in. Get rid of it. Destroy that stable environment and put her at 10 times more risk of being abused because you're so empowered. Do you see the hypocrisy? Total hypocrisy. From the study, these boots are made for walking, etc. You can look at that study. Child custody. 18% of men get child custody. 82% of women get child custody. Where is the great patriarchy? There. If men are truly in control and think women are just totally useless and they are totally should be stomped on, why do they win the children 82% of the time? Shouldn't it be the opposite if there's a great patriarchy? Do you see? Shouldn't it be the opposite? And I'm not talking, uh, here I'm not talking to people who come to sanctuary, obviously, because the women who come here, at least who choose to come here, you are women who are true women. You are not living for yourself. You are not lusting after power. You are here because, you, and you're getting persecuted, and you're getting abused because you stand up for your bridegroom, for Christ and for Father. So you're real. I'm not talking to you directly here. And, I, and you all know that, right? Now, if you're not here by choice, you can listen to this. Get different information. Think about it. If you're watching from TV or internet, look at the facts. Use your brain. You have a brain. Use it. Child custody, 82% go to women. Child custody, Nebraska Administrative Office published a remarkable new study in 2012. 72% go to mothers. Child custody. Children living with mother only have increased since the 1960s from 8 to 24%. Child support payments average per year. Women, men are amount dues by men and women, amount received by men and women for child support payments. Custodial mothers are awarded child support in 53.4% of the cases compared to only 28.8% for custodial fathers. Half. Where is the patriarchy? Child support payments. Custodial mothers are more likely to receive full or partial child support payments compared to custodial fathers. 32% of custodial fathers receive none of the money owed to them compared to 25% of the custodial mothers. Employment of custodial fathers. 70% 70 70 now down to 66% are full-time working fathers who are custodial fathers. Part-time, 20% and 14% do not work. Employment for custodial mothers, 24% do not work, 29% part-time, only 47% working full-time. The man has to 20% 20, 20 higher, have to work more than women. Where is the patriarchy there? If it's equal, why aren't the women forced to work full-time? It should be equal. They should contribute equally, right? Gender pay gap. Women are paid 77 cents for every dollar a man earns. This is probably the propaganda you heard. In examining the information collected by the 2009 United States Current Population Survey, which is conducted for the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, researchers found that in total sample, women on average earned $36,278 compared to $47,000 of $127 for men. Ha! 
I got you, right? The feminists, yeah, look at that pay gap. We got you. Dopamine, 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 high, high, high. Uh, there's a little problem with this type of statistics, which they do with no other type of statistics. Let's look here. This annual, this 20%, this 23% gap is calculated by averaging the annual earnings of all men and comparing that number to all the average annual earnings of all women. No additional variables were controlled for. No other variables were controlled for, like the ones we just saw, for example, that they're 20% more less likely to hold a full-time job or that there's, pater there's uh, paternity leaves, six months breastfeeding leaves. You don't think that, can a man uh, take six months off to uh, help his child who's dealing with substance abuse and expect to get paid 100% for that year? Can he? You see, the science is total propaganda. No other variables included. Total fraud. And what you hear in the media is total fraud. Why don't you look at the, re what, use your brain and look at the reality of the non-existence of a patriarchy. Work hours. 67% of women work one to 34 hours. Compare that to 33% of men. 68% of men have to work 41 hours or more. Compare that to 32% of women. In the United States, the Fair Labor Standards Act requires employees to be paid 1.5 times their regular rate if they work over 40 hours a week, et cetera. Given that more men work overtime, this is not insignificant in terms of the pay gap. Weekly earnings by marital status. If you are married, this is your pay gap. If you're never married, for men and women, it's essentially equivalent. But I thought it was a patriarchy. No, when you get married and you have children, according to the World Health Organization, you have to feed your baby six months of breastfeeding for healthy neural development. So many women take that opportunity and take leave. Maybe that has a factor in the difference of pay gap. Maybe just a little. Of course, we can't factor in those variables because it would not be expedient for the governmental programs or the fog of propaganda to brainwash and make women delusional and totally irresponsible. Right? Workplace deaths in the U.S. Men die 93% of the cases of workplace deaths. You know, we should really fight for women's equality in the workplace, right? Let's have 50% of men die and 50% of women die. It's all for equality and gender rights. Yes! Dopamine, dopamine, right? Do you, do you see how much programming you have? Even if you don't believe in the general hype of the propaganda, you've been totally trained by society to have highs when you hear those things. Workplace deaths. 93% of men die at the workplace. Where is the patriarchy there? Child support payments to rapists. Courts in several states have forced male victims to pay child support to their rapists, both statutory and otherwise. <laughs> you read that correctly. Underage male rape victims have been forced to pay support for children fathered during sex they did not consent to and legally could not consent to at the time. In California, an appellate court upheld an order, San Luis Abis Obispo Count, County v. Nathan J. Forced a 15-year-old boy, that is obviously pedophilia by, by the women, by the woman, 15-year-old boy to pay child support to his rapist after he became pregnant and gave birth. I'm sorry, after she became pregnant and gave birth, the 15-year-old boy who was raped was forced to pay for the baby after he was raped. But of course, men cannot ever have be forcibly you know, had made to have sex because they can control their erections, right? I know Tibetan Buddhist monks who cannot control their erections. You understand that? <laughs> if you know anything about men, when you're 15 years old, even if you bump into a podium, you're gonna get an erection. 
It is not all based on sexual stimulation. You wake up with erections. You, if you're terrified, you can get an erection. Yes, so scientifically it's proven. Maybe some of you have erections now. <laughs> this is reality, reality, folks. A young boy who was raped by an older woman in pedophilia and statutory rape is forced to pay for the baby. The court ruled that although the babe boy was considered too young to provide consent to the sexual act, he was a willing participant and thus liable to pay support. An adult male in Louisiana was forced to pay child support to a woman who had him wear a condom during oral sex. The woman took the condom, extracted the sperm, and impregnated herself without consent. The National Legal Research Group refers to this as a strict liability theory of sperm, i.e. a man is liable for his sperm no matter what the circumstance. Child support and non-payment. One of the most shocking elements of child support is the Bradley Amendment, which for forbids child support debt from being retroactively reduced or forgiven. Payments must be enforced regardless of any change in income, military deployment, incarceration, hospitalization, ability to see children, or even if false paternity is conclusively established and recognized by the court. So if you are falsely accused of having a baby, and according to the Bradley Amendment, or even let's say you're deployed, you're deployed to a different place, you have, you, have, you have to still pay child support. Even though you have a major reduction in income, you still have to pay child support in the same amount. Does it go down? Even if you've been falsely accused, you have to pay it. Where is the patriarchy? I thought there was a looming, monstrous patriarchy which is here to oppress women and, and, and fight for men and raise men up and grow. No, no. I'm sorry. Where is the patriarchy? Lawyer Phyllis Shafley wrote most of the re reservists who are army reservists, people who fight in the wars, right, to protect their liberties, uh, people's liberties, called up to serve in Iraq were paid, paid a big price, a significant reduction of their wages as they transfer from civilian to military jobs, separation from their loved ones, and of course the risk of battle wounds or death. That is a small little cost, isn't it? <laughs> we get sent off to war and have to risk dying. That's, that's, a, that's a little cost, isn't it? Tiny little cost, right? Reservist child support orders are based on their civilian wages, and when they are called up to active duty, that burden doesn't decrease. Few can get court modification before they leave. Modifications are seldom granted anyway, and even if a father applies for modification before deployment, the debt continues to grow until the case is decided much later. So much for support the troops. So much for support the troops. Child support, this is, the, this is Frank Hatley. There's no horrific stories, uh, shortage of horrific stories of the Bradley Amendment, etc., which upon hearing immediate change your perception of deadbeat deaths. Frank Hatley spent 19 months in jail for failure to pay child support despite the fact that he does not have any children in 1986. Did you hear that? He went to jail for 19 months despite the fact he has no kids. He has no kids, but he went to prison for not paying for his kids. Do you, do you understand that? I'm going to say that again. He got no kids. He went to jail because he has to pay for his kids, which he don't got. You understand? In 1986, Hadley's girlfriend became pregnant, gave birth to a son. She had infidelity, which she claimed was his. The relationship ended shortly after the boy's birth, and the couple never married and never lived together, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In 2009, Hadley was released after 13 months in jail. And in 2006, he was jailed again for 13 months. And in an incredible rare occurrence, his back payments were waived. However, the state still did not restore his driver's license. Despite her infidelity, infidelity and falsely naming him as a father and causing him days and days and days and days of stress and distress and jail time, she got zero repercussions. Zero repercussions. Where is the patriarchy? Where is it? Where is the patriarchy? I thought there's the looming monster in the closet that should boogie you, and so you give up your resources. <laughs> alimony payments per year. State alimony laws, many passed in the 1960s and 70s, were designed to help, now non help non working or lesser earning spouses after divorce. Many states allow for recipients to receive their whole lives, payments for life. 
That is, this is in, adjusted for inflation. It was in 1993, 8.4 billion. Now it's 11.2 billion dollars in alimony, using the IRS total of 11.2 billion alimony payments for 2012. Women received 10.5 billion for that year, 94 percent. Men received only six percent of alimony. Where's the patriarchy? Where, where's the patriarchy? Where's the unbelievable gender bias against women? How about where? How about there is a gender bias against men, and there is a matriarchy. Yep. Is the reality. What do I mean by a matriarchy? Well, look at studies in childcare, 1997. A study by U.S. National Institutes of Child Health and Human Development found that even at the age of 15 months, boys in childcare receive lower quality and less positive interactions from their caregivers compared to girls. There are many explanations as to why this could be the case. For example, boys may be likely to reject an authority figure and act aggressively, thus eliciting a negative response from their caregiver. Sadly, in 1997, study did not develop, delve deeper into this particular dynamic. However, a 2012 landmark study documented the same discrimination against boys and elaborated on the drivers behind it. As hypothesized, the caregivers of the toddlers in the same sample of, the sem of this sample revealed significantly more negative perceptions of boys than girls. They not only portrayed boys as displaying more problematic, active, and disinhibited behaviors, but also indicated that their relationship with boys were characterized by greater conflict and less closeness than their relationship with girls. Importantly, the care caregivers' portrayal of their relationship with boys and girls as conflictual or close were significantly intercorrelated with their portrayals of whether the children displayed behavior problems and active angry temperaments, suggesting a strong generalized negative boys or positive girls view of the children in their care. Their perceptions of the children were also associated with caregiving qualities such that more negative views of a given child, regardless of gender, predicted poorer quality caregiving, rated by independent observers for that child. So when independent observers went into child care programs, of which the overwhelming majority, 94.1% of, of child care workers are women, 94% of child care workers are women. If you grow up in urban areas, you are highly likely to never have a male authority figure until the time you are in high school. Highly likely. You were, you were raised up in a single mother home. You have daycares, which are 94% women, 0.1% women. You have elementary schools, which are dominated by women. Maybe the principal's a man, but he doesn't have real interaction with you. Middle school teachers also the majority of women, only when you get to high school will you actually meet a male authority figure, but you're like 13, 14 by that time. You see? So in the West now, there is no patriarchy. There is a matriarchy. Women have the overwhelming majority of time raising young boys and girls in the Western world. There is no patriarchy. There is a matriarchy. And, of course, by the study, by independent observers, not by women, not by men, independent observers who are looking for what? Importantly, this gendered pattern of child care experience is evident at two years of age prior to the age at which boys and girls differ significantly in their play behavior as reported in this literature and as confirmed by our observations of the toddlers in this study. The finding regarding caregiver portrayals of their relationships with children is of particular concern in light of substantial evidence that positive student-teacher caregiver relationships play an important and perhaps predictive role in fostering children's positive engagement in both academic and social aspects of early learning. The researchers also made an interesting remark in this study. It is difficult to believe that these caregivers of two-year-old children have developed gender-linked stereotypes that disadvantage boys. Although this is precisely what our found findings imply. Two, so from two years of age, if you're a boy, you will have gender-linked stereotypes that disadvantage you as a boy. As a boy. This is a clear indication of sexism. Clear indication of sexism. Where women child givers, caregivers, view generally boys as problematic or overactive girls. They don't sit, sit as well, et cetera, et cetera. And this independent study clearly showed that you are disadvantaged if you're a boy growing up in the West because you're not a good boy because there are theories on kinetic types of education which men need or boys need. They're not really apt to sit in long rows of iron seats and have somebody squeaking at them at the chalkboard and learn. They learn by movement and action. 
normally. So what we can see is a massive fraud. The idea, and it's so interesting because you can see the family frauderation is eating this up. They are spitting it out like they are part of the government propaganda machine because they are. They want to extort money and resources for irresponsible women. Irresponsible, dishonorable women who are irresponsible and dishonorable and want to always victimize themselves. It's very interesting because the real reality shows, the real reality shows, and of course, why the family Fred is crumbling, totally crumbling, is because, of course, they're a total betrayal of father. And that whole hostility towards men, that hostility towards father, that hostility, oh, he was, he was bad. He was the one who victimized mother. He was the one who made our life hard. He was the one who made our lives hard. This victimization fits right in with the general narrative of government propaganda feminism. Fits right in. And it's a great way to make good men feel guilty to be able to be extracted from and their resources to be stolen from them. So I tell the good people of this, of whoever watches, man or woman alike, you're honorable, you're honest, you do not support dishonorable women. Do not support them. You have no obligation to support people who desecrate father. And of course, dishonorable men as well, who are being led by a dishonorable woman. You have no obligation to fund them. You have no obligation to serve them. And you should man up and woman up and call them what they are. Total frauds. <laughs> Amma, you want to say something on that? <laughs> real quick, real quick. So it's a one okay. o'clock, so we did, didn't we do the <laughs> as a responsible and honorable man and woman? Let us give a one more big round of applause to our Pastor Moon. It was a difficult. Uh, um, Topic to digest, right? It's so one o'clock, honey. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll short my uh, I'll, I'll brief of, on my remark. You know, one time, um, not not just one time, several times, I I sit in the lecture uh, that was done by Divine Principle lecture done by woman, and then you know we we always have that. Um, shaky topic there, right? Chapter two, the Eve fell first, right? And then in that, in the, uh, whenever the uh, Eve fell first, and then uh, the, the room becomes all of a sudden so quiet, and then she's a woman lecturer, so it becomes quieter. And then a uh, couple of times, you know, um, this woman divine lecturer, she, she said, uh, you know what? Yeah, Eve fell, and that's why she get blamed everything. And then, you know what? Where was Adam at that time? You know, he should have protected her. He should have told her, no, you shouldn't have done that. And then, like, a, a woman is like, all the women in the audience say, yeah, that's right, where was Adam? Where was Adam? And then men are like, oh, they were so ashamed and guilt, and then they are like rolling their eyes. They don't know where to. They avoid eye contact with the lecture, right, women lecture. And that was the typical uh, thing that happened whenever there's a, a chapter two lecture by a uh, female. And then I have to admit that I was uh, one of those women, I didn't shout it out, but in my mind, yeah, that's right, where was Adam? That was exactly, you know, my um, reaction. I was cheering for that actually. But you know what? We have to think about it. Is that a real woman empowerment or fake woman empowerment? Because what it actually, when you open the, uh, in a box, what the female, the lecturer was actually saying is, you know what, man, it, woman is so dumb. They can't tell what is wrong and what is right, what is evil and what is good. That's why men always have to be there to tell her, stop her, oh, you better stop it like this. Woman, the, the woman, man has to always hover around the woman because woman is brain dead. That's what is it actually saying on the flip side, see that? That's why this is not a real woman empowerment. And think about it, you know what? 
with me, actually, you know, as as a woman, I always felt like, oh yeah, why we Eve did that? You know, that's bad. Because of her, we get all the blame. What's wrong with her? And we do that, right? And then、oh, we feel so guilt whenever I read a Genesis. That's something that I did not want to read. But you know what? Recently, I really found that it's actually God's love that He's He's warning to women. Think about it. If you are if you are criminal. Criminal will target the easier prayer, not the difficult prayer, right? And then when 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 a when a, when, a, when a criminal wants to break into house, he is not gonna pick a house that is like a closely tight, shut down, and then there's a surveillance, there's a camera, security camera, and then they they not they gonna avoid that house. But the house that they will try to target is some some places like the door is not locked and the window is open and the, there's no security camera. The criminal will target those houses. Easier prayer. So, as a archangel in the、uh, in the Garden of Eden, who did he target? He had a two target, Adam and Eve, and then he figured that woman is easier target. That's why he went to a woman to tempt her for power. You will become like God. You know what? Your eyes will open. See that? So I realized, wow, that is true. We are actually more vulnerable to this temptation, to this sweet tongue, to the sweet lie. That is why God is giving us extra warning. So be careful, woman. Be careful from the archangel's temptation. That is actually God's extra love to warn woman not to fall into this trap. You know, as we really hear today's、uh, feminism, the the irony of feminism, the real truth about feminism, I know our heart is like us somewhere uncomfortable. But you know what? I really believe the woman who is strong and courageous, and who are who are willing to die and live for Christ, who will rise and to protect the Christ, even though they get persecution. They are the true women that Father talked about. They are the honor of the women. That they are the superhero, and they are the superwoman, and they are the true hope for this new woman's era. Aju, Aju, Amen. Wow, thank you, Amma. Let's now end with Chen Sheng Yang five thirty six. Let's read together. In order to accomplish your portion of responsibility, what should you do? What should you do to become people who can fulfill their portion of responsibility? You just stand in a position to deny everything that was born from the emotional connection to and lineage of Satan. Amen. Amen. Let's all rise, everybody, and we want to pray. Let's pray together. If you could hold somebody's hand next to you, Father, we come before you this day. Father, we ask you to open our eyes and open our hearts, Father. As we face reality, stop believing the fog of propaganda that Satan puts out for us to consume. Father, we are free and moral agents, women and men who are hundred percent responsible for our actions. We are free agents who can decide moral things, and we are made in Your image. So, Father, the whole culture of trying to make women irresponsible. To have them be blameless and avoid responsibility, this satanic culture which disempowers women and makes them prop objects in window rooms. Let people see through that fake fraud. Let real women rise up, and men who love them and support them and encourage them, who strengthen them. Let real people stand who are willing to be true. To be honest, to be honorable, to live with virtue and goodness and righteousness, to seek after Your face, to give You glory, Father. One thing that the fake, fraudulent movements of Satanism, whether they be radical feminism or socialism, etc., they only tempt people to live for their own lusts of power. But the real women, the age of women that Father prophesied, we know can never be led by those type of prostitutes who sell themselves out to throw away responsibility and freedom. It can only by led be led. The true women's era can only be led by real women 
who take complete responsibility and complete ownership in every decision they make without blaming anybody else and any negative thing, taking the blame with courage. To be strong and righteous, to be fearless and courageous, and to live for a greater purpose than that of narcissism and self-absorption. To live for something greater, which is the creator, which is their creator. Which is the one who loves them and formed them from before they were in their mother's womb. Father, we pray for those brides of Christ to stand forth this day. The true women that will lead the true revolution to bring about a peaceful world. That will lead in the new millennia, not by lust of power, but by surrendering to their God. Giving glory, living for the glory of their God. Stop believing in boogeyman patriarchies and realize how advantaged they are and fight to lift up their sons and their husbands. Fight to let rise, raise a generation of young men who are not abused and who are not disadvantaged, but who can be proud of themselves as men and can be those who can lift up men and women in the next generation. Father, we thank you so much this day. We thank you for the challenging words that have given, that have been preached today. And Father, we pray that these would pierce through any hardened hearts that are watching from around the world or any of them here. We take responsibility for what we believe and what we do, and we give you all the glory, praise, and honor. We report this in the names of Central Blessed Families here and worldwide, and we give you all the praise. Amen and adieu. Amen and adieu. Give your hu husband or wife a hug, your neighbor. Encourage them and say, be real, be real. Be real, be real. <laughs> Please take your I'd like to introduce to you uh, Roman and uh, Leticia Prescia. Uh, they are the people that uh, we've, been, we've been praying for quite a while now for, someone to, for God to lead us to someone in, in the Philippines who could stand up and be uh, uh, God's representative, of uh, true father's uh, leader in the Philippines. Because there are a lot of thousands of members in, in the Philippines and a lot of them have been connecting to Sanctuary Church. We didn't have anyone who could be a, a central point. Uh, but now, unfortunately, uh, God has a, a called a couple. Uh, Roman uh, introduces himself. He says, I met true parents while I was studying in college in 1983, and uh, I decided to stop my studies then and work in the church full time. Uh, I did a lot of uh, fundraising uh, and witnessing, and he went through three days, seven days, 21 day workshops, two times, so 40 days, and many uh, revival events. And um, uh, he's also a black belt in Wonhua Do, or Tongil Mudo. So, yeah, 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 we're good in the Philippines. And he's an instructor of uh, martial arts, and he's been an instructor in every center where he has worked. And then uh, they are blessed in the uh, 360,000 couple blessing in 1995, and uh, their couple was appointed as a cluster leader in our area, and we held blessings many times in our neighboring uh, barangays. And uh, uh, his wife, Leticia, uh, says that um, uh, my faith uh, in true parents has never wavered since I met them in 1982 when my brother brought me to the center after I graduated from high school. I was just uh, 17 years old then, and um, uh, she's worked a full-time in mission there, uh, and uh, has done a lot of fundraising and, and witnessing also. So... Uh, we're very uh, happy today uh, to be able to witness, uh, to be able to anoint, to have our king anoint uh, Roman and Leticia uh, Prescia as uh, the Sanctuary Church and National Leaders for the Philippines. Okay, I'm going to come on up here. All right, Roman and Leticia, I would like to ask you, are they joining us right now? They're joining, okay. I would like to ask you to come forth to the altar, so that would be uh, in front of your screen. Please stand. And join us in prayer, Roman and Natisha Prescia. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this glorious day. Father, we thank you for Roman and Natisha Prescia, true son of God and a bride of Christ. Father, who is standing up and putting on the full armor of God in the Philippines. 
Father, there are so many lost souls in the Philippines who have been deceived by the fraud of the Han mother. And Father, they live in such disparity and they live with no hope for the future. But Father, we now see a couple, a couple that says enough is enough and that we must return to our king. Father, we thank you for Roman and Tasha Prescia, those who are willing to stand and be persecuted by the Family Federation Church there in the Philippines. Their course will not be easy. Many will come against them. Their lives may be even threatened. But Father, we ask that you would anoint them and strengthen them for this task. The warrior spirit that he has cultivated through martial arts training, we pray that will be used to give him the spiritual power that he will need to fight through the obstacles that Satan will put before him. Father, we also pray for all the other communities that are already gathering around this beautiful couple. We pray for their safety and we pray for their strength that they may stand in oneness, in obedience and faith in Christ. And they may live and die with honor and virtue, with righteousness, not self-righteousness, but righteousness of the Lord clothing them. Father, we thank you and we ask that you arm them with the shield of faith with the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of truth, the word, the sword of the spirit, the belt of truth, and the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Father, we ask that you arm with them with the spear of prayer so that they would ask and move with the spiritual world and all the spiritual beings and angels and ancestors, etc., that are willing and able to fight at this time. We ask that also the ancestors who will be liberated will pray for them, anoint them. If any Filipino ancestors are in the ancestries of the many that will be liberated, we pray that they would go and help protect Roman and Natasha Persia. Father, we thank you for this couple, this couple who is standing up in the face of total Goliath's opposition. And we, we ask that they would be strengthened, that they would be given the quickening of the throwing stone so that they will fell that giant and free the people of God. We thank you so much and we give you all the thanks for this appointment today. We ask your special protection and blessing upon them in the Philippines and all those families who are in their hearts they know and are coming back to you. We ask that you move with your Holy Spirit and you pour out the gifts of the Spirit there in their midst and that they will have revival, restoration, and they will see the moving of the Spirit of God in and amongst the flesh of man. We thank you so much. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor. We report this in our name of the Central Blessed Family, and I appoint them in the name of the three kingships of God. Amen. And Aju. Roman and Natasha Prussia. We love you. Stand strong, brother and sister. Stand strong. Thank you very much. Let's go have lunch.